Welcome back to the Titans of Food Service podcast. As always, thank you for joining me here on another episode. Today, I welcome the president of Taste Specific, Joel Robbins. And we dive deep into the food service world. We talk about the food service agency model and how he helps brands with their food service marketing needs, as well as sampling. One of the most difficult and most cost prohibitive parts of the food service sales uh, industry is the cost of getting out samples. It's very, very expensive. Anywhere you ship it or send it also can be very timely. And he's created a, a model in which brands can leverage his efficiencies to better get out samples, break them down into packs and make it a lot more efficient for the salespeople to be effective. So buckle up. It's a fun conversation. Let's go ahead and welcome Joel. Joel, welcome to the Titans of Food Service podcast. I'm so glad that you are joining us here today on another episode. I've been looking forward to our conversation. Thank you for joining. Thank you. I'm pretty excited. All right. Very good. So I'm curious, where where are you based? I am uh, very fortunate and lucky. I am based out of sunny Palm Springs, California. Nice. And I would imagine it's probably starting to heat up a little bit out there. I know in uh, living in Southern Cal myself, it's been a little colder to start the year, but I think the summer is going to be a warm one. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was a rough winter and people go, oh, you know, oh, they feel sorry for us because we only hit the 60s. And yeah, but, you know, today we're topping off into the 90s and by Friday we're back to the hundreds. So we're going to be some happy people here. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. That's what we look forward to, yeah. <laughs> So what, why don't we go back to the beginning? How did you get into the for the food service industry? It, it was actually a great story. When I first started, I started in a fine dine restaurant, one of the top 125 in the country in a very small upstate New York town and had just had a great opportunity. Met a customer that was in the restaurant one night who was interested in our wine cellar. Mm -hmm. and had a conversation with him in between courses and offered to take him down and give him a tour of the wine cell. At that time, the restaurant stocked about 28,000 bottles of wine in inventory. And uh, he asked me what I was actually going to do for the rest of my life. And I told him I was just getting ready to graduate college. I made a commitment with the restaurant to stick with them through college. They offered, offered uh, financially and helped me out through college. And he was with Hilton Hotels, and he was my break. And uh, so I drove from uh, Elmira Heights, New York, which is a very small town in upstate New York, to Wilmington, Delaware, which I had never been, and drove in, five-hour drive, did an interview, turned around, got back in the car, and drove home. And two days later, they offered me the job. And it was, it, it, it was incredible. And I did that for several years, about four, four and a half, five years. And I met a food broker and I started to learn what the food brokers were doing. And I ended up leaving that job for another opportunity with a local, very, very high end, very busy restaurant on a Saturday night. You know, back then it was all cash. Nobody paid with credit cards. And we were doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week, beautiful waterfront restaurant, uh, yachts pulling up all the time. Sort of looks like we're, you know, California is over in Newport Beach or yep. any of those nowadays. It's like, talk about full circle. And several food brokers were coming into the restaurant to see the chef, and they just didn't understand the right time to come in. And coming in uh, in the middle of the summer on an afternoon around 11 a.m. when you're about to see, you know, 500 people for lunch just wasn't the time to get the chef out of the kitchen. So I was the guy at the door. I was the general manager of the, uh, the location and I didn't let him pass me and started talking to one of them. And he said to me, he says, you know, what do you think? And I've been doing this for a couple of years and doing breakfast, lunch and dinner. I have so much empathy for people in the restaurant business. And I think that's why I understand them so well is it's a long day and some days it's not very rewarding. Some days it's very rewarding and it's a tough business and people don't understand how difficult the business is. They just mm -hmm. don't, unless you're actually there, you don't understand it. And so I 
started talking to one of the brokers and he hooked me up with somebody who was just leaving their brokerage, forming his own. And, and in uh, August of 1993, had a great opportunity and moved into the brokerage business and haven't looked back since. And it's, it's just been a great run. I, I cannot complain. And it got me here today to where I am doing what I'm doing. And that's working with the manufacturers and the brokers on the other side of the business now. And I think the reason why we do it so well is because we understand the restaurant business, we understand food service, and we understand what the brokers go through with the manufacturers. And mm -hmm. I think that's why we all pair up so well in the industry. I tried to leave once, it didn't work. I tried. I, I always like to think this is an industry, you don't pick it, it picks you. And it's hard to get out. And those who do leave, a lot of times they end up coming back or really wanting to come back in. And that's exactly what happens. Anytime you try, and I've said it for years, people have tried to leave the industry and I said, you'll be back. Yeah. And sure enough, they're back. Even when they retire, there are some that come back. So yes. yeah, it, it, it takes a special kind of person to be in this industry. And, but it, there, you know, like you said, there's tough days, but then there's a lot of days where it's just a, adrenaline pinching and you, you, mm -hmm. You fight for that that kind of high, you know, over and over and over again, which makes it a really fun industry. It's something that I didn't. It's an industry I didn't think I was going to be in. You know, my dad had been in it for all of his career, mm -hmm. and I wanted to go a different path, but ended up getting in, and I've really loved every minute of it. And it has great people, and uh, it really is a, a pretty small knit community. Yeah, I've been at it now, going on forty two years now. And I, I just can't believe I've been at this for 42 years and, and honestly love it. I mean, I absolutely love, you know, what we're doing. And to me, I think it just is incredible, you know? Totally. I, I'm curious when you were at the restaurant and you had some sort of agreement set up where they, they pay for a portion of your college. How did you get that? That's something you're not here. You don't hear of every day. This was back in the 80s. Uh, okay. You probably weren't born yet. But uh, I think we had that conversation once before. <laughs> um, you know, things were a lot yes. different. Things were a lot different then. And, you know, college back then was $5,000 to go to college. And the whole deal was, you know, stay with a restaurant, uh, continue working, you know, put your 30 hours a week in, keep your grades up, and we will help you with tuition. And that's exactly what they did. And they kept, uh, they kept their deal. And that's just what made it so good and the opportunity. And I think it's taught me a lot for where I am today. And the reason why I believe, you know, in my business, it's what can I do to help others grow their business? It's my sure. way of saying, you know, hey, yeah, running a business, but I want to figure out how can I give back, you know, to those that are in the business. Yeah, absolutely. And when you got into the food brokerage side, what was it about that individual that you talked to who was starting a new company, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially no name at that time, had no business, I would imagine. What was that like and why did you decide to make that leap? You know, it was it was interesting. He was with another broker in the market mm -hmm. and uh, they were a pretty, you know, prestigious broker in the market. And a couple of them went their separate ways to form their own. He had an opportunity. And the reason he had an opportunity, and it doesn't seem like it happens anymore, but it used to, you know, with conflicts. Everybody has conflicts these days. Yeah. Um, over the years, we started calling them crossovers to, you know, make the manufacturers feel good about, oh, yeah, we can handle it. It's just a crossover. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was there was a couple of lines that needed to go elsewhere. Uh, to allow the other broker to continue doing what they were doing. So he took those lines and opened up the brokerage. And it was just wow. a great opportunity. And there was a small distributor at the time. Uh, the territory was New York City all the way down to the Virginias, and that included North Carolina. And it was a little Cisco op call called Langford Cisco. Um, some of the best people in the industry, Fred Langford, who was the president at the time and his father had founded the business and his brother was involved. His brother ended up going to corporate and it, it was just a great opportunity. And then, you know, over the years we lost territory as Cisco Metro became uh, established mm -hmm. and Tartan Foods in Philadelphia became Cisco Philadelphia. And then uh, we lost the Carolinas, we lost Virginia, but every time we kept losing territory, the business kept growing. 
And I remember when I first started, I had three manufacturers uh, at the food show. And I'm looking around everybody else who's got full lines of rows of booths. And I'm like, okay, someday we'll get there. And 16 years later, when I turned the, the account over to someone else, as I was moving into a different role in the brokerage, uh, we had 48 booths in the food show. And I wow. thought, well, you know, we, and I, I will say it, the exact same thing I say now that I said before, it wasn't me. It was the team that we had built. And it was because of those five people on my team that we were able to do that. And it was also because we had good manufacturers. We had manufacturers that trusted us and believed in us. Mm -hmm. And honestly, at that time, you know, it was a lot different in the world. And my buyers at, at Langford, you know, were just amazing. And we communicated and we were honest. And trust me, we screwed up and I screwed up and things were said. And, you know, we've all been in front of a buyer and you say something or you, you didn't plan on saying something and it came out. And now you got to fix that problem. And. You know, it was, it, it was fantastic. It, it was a great run in the industry and I loved it. And that's where, you know, I said, everybody that's in the broker business, you got to figure out a way to love it. And if you're loving it, it just makes every day so much mm -hmm. easier. Yeah, it really does. It really does. I'm curious on, on your, at the first, first food show you did, you had three booths of the other brokers that were there mm -hmm. who had many more booths. How many of those brokers are currently still around today? Um, as the same name, two of them out of, I would say at wow. the time there were about 16 different brokers in the market in the Baltimore or Washington wow. market. There were about 16 different brokerages. Two of them are still around as the same 16. name. All the others have, yeah. Oh yeah. And all the others have merged and become part of something else, you know, over the years, it was, let's become a regional broker. And so they became regional brokers. And then it was, you know, the national broker started forming. And, you know, and one of those brokers who was a, one of the first regionals is still a national broker today with the same name. Wow. That's it. Just one, but the rest Isn't of them, you know, it's, it's changed. The broker industry has changed a lot. Yeah. You know, if you look at it, I can only speak to here on the West Coast, but 16 brokers in any one market. I mean, we, we definitely don't have that many uh, on the food service side. You know, there might be six or seven, maybe eight. Um, I guess you have your a, a few mom and pops and there may be like a single or two people team. But, you know, the industry looks a lot different, mm -hmm. especially coming off of nationalization. And uh, it's provided new opportunities and new challenges. It's been you know, I've only been a part of the industry for just under 10 years, and I've seen a lot of changes just in my years of doing it so far. When you got into the brokerage business, who were some of the people that helped you along the way? It was interesting. I had a regional manager from Pies Inc. at the time, okay. who then was Mrs. Smith's Bakeries then became part of Schwann's when Schwann's purchased them. Well, Mrs. Smith was bought by Flowers and Flowers sold them off to Schwann's. And I had a regional manager at the time who I really looked up to. And this guy always showed up in a starched white shirt, a blue blazer with, you know, brass buttons and always had pressed pants and penny loafers. And just, you could tell he knew what he was doing. He was a professional. And I always had great conversations with him and between him. And then I had four regional managers, all women. And those four regionals are still out there today. You know, they're all in different roles, but they're all still in the food industry. And I still look back and go the four of them when they were my regional managers for different manufacturers, they believed in me and they listened. Because I was always the creative one. I was always, you know, I came out of school with an advertising and marketing degree, but I wasn't really, I wasn't really using it because I was, on, well, I was, but I wasn't. But now I look at it and go, well, I really was. It was all about marketing and sales. And then the gentleman who owned the bro brokerage that I worked for mm -hmm. over the years, I mean, I was with him for a long time. And 
he trusted my decisions and he always allowed me to make my own decision. And he'd always tell me, he says, you know, you're going to make mistakes along the way, but I'll support you with your mistakes. I'm not going to call you out in front of people. I'll pull you aside and we'll talk about it just so that it doesn't happen again. And to me, to this day, I still talk to him probably two to three times a month. I get emails from him all the time with little cartoons. He's still in the industry. Uh, not on the food broker side, he's wow. on the industrial broker side where he originally started in the business. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there, it, it's, there's, there's still people out there who are the same type of people in the industry. They're still there. And I, I say to everybody, you know, the, especially the younger broker crowd, listen to those that have been doing it for a long time and value what they're telling you, because I think it really helps. Yeah. Yeah, totally. As you came out of the brokerage business, where did you go from there? So when we, we were a Maryland broker, had an opportunity okay. to join and become a Northeast broker. And at that time, uh, one of the biggest brokers in the market, Venture Sales Group, John Bob Whopper, very well known in the industry. Uh, we actually merged in with them. They purchased us. We merged in with them. And along with John Wood, who's another legend in the market, which was JLW Food Sales down in Virginia, John and Lou Hutchinson and their team. And we formed a Northeast of Venture Sales Group. And then a couple of months later, one of the big ones came calling and said, uh, we want to form a national broker. And uh, it happened. And about 11 months later, on April of 2012, uh, we became a national broker. We were the first purchase that they made into the industry. Uh, there were about, uh, oh my gosh, 38 of them following that. I think it was total 38 different brokerages across the country. Wow. And I was already doing marketing and agency work for venture. That's when I, I had, right before I had uh, left on the brokerage side and went into the agency side. And when we went national, my goal was to, and my uh opportunity was they asked me to build out the marketing and agency side of the business. And that's what we did. And from 2012 on, uh, we built our agency. And it was a it was a great run with the company. I mean, the company is still around, as you know, and uh, but they decided to focus on food service. And so we parted ways and we you know, continued doing what we're doing. We left the company and formed our own agency. And now we're full blown uh, advertising and creative marketing agency doing what we're doing, working with a lot of the same clients, brought on uh, several additional clients. And, and here we are today, you know, and it, it's great because now I can work with not just the one national broker I was working with, I can work with any broker around the country. Thus, mm -hmm. the reason why I, you know, contacted you and said, we need to talk, you know, you're in my backyard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, you know, and I, I really enjoy working, you know, with younger brokers and people that are, mm -hmm. you know, building their business, because to me, if I can't help you grow your sales, you really don't need me. Right. And that's what we say to our clients on the agency side is we'll come up with all the ideas. We'll come up with a way of savings. We'll, we'll give you our expertise, what we know, because we're experts in agency for food service. You know, we know the brokerage business, we know the GPOs, we know the segments and there's, you know, there's a lot of good agencies out there that, and everybody does something different. And for us is I, I tell manufacturers, you don't need to get rid of your agency. That's not what we're there for. We're not, we're not, we don't want to replace them. We want to bring other value that they may not be bringing to you or work with that agency with the knowledge that we've got. Because the end result is if you're not moving, if the manufacturer is not selling cases and the broker is not selling cases, you don't need any of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Yeah. In, in my opinion, an agency, besides doing the marketing side, needs to be an extension of the sales force of your product. They have mm -hmm. to understand your product. They have to know the segments of the business. They've got to understand operations. And I think that's what made us successful doing what we're doing. Totally. Yeah. What are some on the agency side? What are some of the services that you currently offer to your clients? So naturally graphic design, as you know, is okay. probably the number one, mm -hmm. but I find value in the right food photography because there's so many shots that are done that don't speak to, we go back to the segments and I say this all the time, 
there's really it's not really good to have a a, a young eight-year-old child eating a sandwich with a lunch tray and walking into a BNI and account with that as your point of sale trying to sell your product. Right. And you don't walk into a amusement park or a theme park or a sports venue with an elderly woman laying in a hospital bed eating her lunch. And we've seen so many manufacturers that do this or they overwork the recipe. They just make it to, in today's world, you know, it's got to be simple. And how many times can you use something in a menu in 10 different ways? Or how many few ingredients can you use so that the kitchen can assemble it very quickly? And so recipe development for us is a big thing for me. It's creating the right recipes, creating the right photography and selling the right story. But I think our number one is samples and it's okay. getting the right sample to the right operator getting the right size sample to the broker and i think what we do in sample management is really i think we do something that nobody else does and that's what we push tell me about that how does that work so we've had a long time partnership since 2012 with what we call our brick and mortar we don't okay. have a per se office my entire team is around the country we see each other a couple of times a year. We get together as an entire team once a year, and uh, I'll see a good chunk of the team in t uh, next week in Chicago at the uh, at the NRA. All right. Um, but we have a partnership with our brick and mortar. They do our print. They do our fulfillment. They do our sample program, and it's a SQF. We're so we're SQF certified with a facility. We are USDA FDA. But what's amazing is, and I'm, I'm surprised more manufacturers aren't doing it manufacturers really don't know what it costs to do samples. Manufacturers really don't know where their samples are going. And I mean, seriously, let's go into every broker's office. Let's open up the freezer and it's a science experiment and we all know it and they all know it. It's not a secret. I'm not giving away any, any, you know, top secret things today, but it's a science experiment. And, you know, when you look at the cost of samples, if I can save a manufacturer, 25% on their sample budget, yet grow their sales, to me, that should be really important to the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 pound box of pork chops, what do you need that for as a broker? And, you know, it's, it's different when you're working in, you know, a smaller market. So if you're working in Grand Rapids, Michigan, it's easy. It, well, that's not a good example anymore. But if you're working in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, or you're there working you in Palm Springs, I'll use Palm Springs. You're the broker in Palm Springs. It takes you three minutes to get from one side of the town to the other. Mm -hmm. But if your office is in Southern California and you have to drive to your office, which is only, let's say, 20 miles, that hour and 45 minute drive in each direction. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we all know it. Yeah. You know, that is Houston. That is Dallas. That is, you know, Miami. That is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's Charlotte, North Carolina, Philadelphia, New York. To make a broker drive an hour and a half to go pick up and bag up four pork chops when it can all be done professionally with the literature, with the coupons, with the recipes. Yeah. You know the manufacturers we want them to look at that and say wow we can we can really do that and they didn't realize they can do it because manufacturers are they're awesome at making product you know they they need the brokers to help them get that product to market and they need us to show them how we can track every sample how we can make the brokers account for every sample i'm going to pick on the brokers now you got to tell us where you take it but what's more important is that database. And if you're getting that where the samples are going and you're following up where those samples are going, and then it's talking to you like as a broker saying, okay, let's look at three or four of your brokers that belong on the menu together, on the plate together, on the concept together. And imagine if you could take four of your manufacturers and it doesn't have to be the four biggest. It can be that one center of the plate and three of those second tier manufacturers and create the concept and put those into a sample kit that's mm -hmm. already pre-done with everything ready to go and you ship it directly to the broker's house. I mean, how ideal would that be? And what's the broker gonna do? That's what they're gonna take out. 
Yeah. That's... In, I know in every office, and I'm sure you're targeting it in your office, you're telling your salespeople, these are the lines we need to focus on. These are the products they want to focus on. And if you could provide them with one piece of literature that's customized with their name and those items on that piece of literature, along naturally with the master catalogs of everybody else, but if you can provide them customized literature with that information, with the recipes, and with a sample kit, they're going to go out there. They're going to embrace the manufacturers. They're going to push the product and manufacturers will see more sales. Yeah, I, I'd say you're definitely spot on. On the broker side, you know, living that reality, it is when it comes to samples, especially, in, you know, being here in California, the traffic, as you mentioned, to go 20 miles could take you over an hour easily. And you want your, your sales team or your broker teams out selling product instead of, you know, driving to the office to pick up, or sometimes we'll go pick up at their location and bring it back to the office. You know, there's a lot of steps, a lot of time along the way, which takes away and eats away at valuable selling time. And there's only so much selling time in a 30 day span of, of, of a month. So it's important mm -hmm. to stay focused on that. Is there anybody else out there that's doing something like this? I feel like you're really solving a need within the food service industry. Oh, did we get disconnected? Yep, we're good. You were just talking about, you know, the, there's only so many, you know, so many hours of selling time in a day. And yeah, and that that's the hard part is if you can maximize your broker's time out on the street by providing them with the tools that they need, that can be very successful. And you can take a, you know, a second tier manufacturer and you can really double digit sales growth, the number of cases by providing them with the right samples, the right literature. You know, a lot of manufacturers don't know how to get into doing rebates and coupons. You know, the mm -hmm. big boys out there, it's easy for them to put 20, 30 coupons out. And I mean, we create coupons all day long. We do the redemptions of the coupons for the manufacturers and we process all of that. But I also tell them it's the database that's coming in with that coupon. If that operator took the time to attach their invoices, fill out the coupon, mail it in or upload it to a site, that's an operator that you want as part of your database. And when you're coming out with a new product, you shouldn't even think twice. That operator should receive a sample kit shipped directly to them from you, personalized from the broker or the manufacturer. We came out with a new product. We want you to try it first. Here's an opportunity because we all know how what has to happen. We need to force distribution. You, you can't just walk into distributors and get slots the way it used to be. It's tough. And if you can, you know, find a, you know, a really good local customer who's taking the time and buying, why not utilize four or five of those in a market who can drive immediate sales and immediate cases? Because it's a lot easier for you to walk into a distributor and say, I've got six customers that are willing to buy five cases a week right now. Mm -hmm. And you've got the business. It's a lot easier to get that slotting. What is the cost to, so, I sort of know a little bit about the business. I guess. Uh, yeah, you, you absolutely do. You absolutely do. Um, what is the cost to get out a sample kit to an operator? You know, the first thing when we talk about savings is shipping because manufacturers don't have the volume of shipping that we're putting through FedEx with this facility. So the shipping alone, when we do analysis for manufacturers, most of them are shipping overnight and they're shipping in okay. the largest thermos container. We all call them the coffins and every broker okay. has them stacked in the back of their offices. And that's the most expensive part. It's not the sample that's the most expensive. It can be, you know, when you're talking mm -hmm. shrimp or you're talking seafood or you're talking, you know, high end desserts, but it's really, if I can go to a manufacturer and say, I can cut your sample, I can cut your shipping costs just by 35 to 40%. And then I can turn around and say, okay, we're buying uh, adjustable size thermos containers, you know, barrier containers by the truckload and you as a manufacturer are not and then also with the shipping has changed these days it's all based on dim weight it's not you know the smaller if you can put a small sample in the smallest possible box 
with the right amount of dry ice or the right amount of gel and ship it in a two day ship and get it to somebody in that two days at perfect temperature. That's what we do. And it's, it's pretty interesting. We were working with a pork supplier a couple years ago and they reached out to their facility, sent them an email and said, send these guys a box of pork chops. So they sent a 15 pound box of pork chops with 90 pounds of dry ice spent over $200 to ship it to us. And we said, first of all, you needed about three pounds of dry ice, not 90. Second of all, they took it because it didn't fit in the styro cooler. So they stood it up on end, wrapped cardboard around where the gap was between the styrofoam. And by the time it got to us, it was, a, it was in the 60 degree mark, way out of temperature. And we could have repacked and shipped that sample and had it to them for about 27 bucks. <laughs> totally. And it's like, you know, that was, that was before, you know, before 2020. So naturally shipping costs are up now significantly from what they used to be. And, you know, we've got some good contracted rates with shipping. And I I just think we, we know how to handle a sample. We can ship dry and frozen and refrigerated, and we can actually ship dry and frozen in the same box. I mean, or refrigerated in the same box with the literature, with the marketing materials and and have it out in second day. And imagine if you're a broker rep and you can go to a website and click the samples you want and enter the distributor or operator's name and 48 hours later, your samples are sitting on your doorstep. Makes your job easy. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Wow, that, I mean, that is, that's a huge time savings. And you know what it, I, again, being on the broker side, I know this is definitely something that if our team had access to something like this, you're just naturally going to show that product more. It's just, it's, it's ease of use. It's right in front of you, uh, to take mm-hmm. out, which, which is, I mean, kudos to you. What are, is there anybody else out there doing something like this? I feel like you have really fulfilled a need within the marketplace. There's nobody doing it the way we're doing it. You know, there's there's some others that are able to ship, yeah. but they can't ship. They can't break a case. They can't open a bag of chicken tenders. They can't take a bag of shrimp and repack it. They they don't have the ability to take a four pound block of soup and cut it into an eight ounce block of soup. You know, that's frozen solid. Um, They don't have the chill rooms to be able to do this or the technology. I mean, the certifications alone, the SQF certification, you know, it took them over a year and a half to get this certificate. And you're talking a lot of money invested in this. And, you know, when you believe in something as much as we do, and I believe in this sample, you know, this sample process, but if it can help the broker, and, and you said the key thing right there is if we can help the broker add two more calls a day because they've opened up that time over, you know, 52 weeks of the year, you know, subtract out the food shows and the holidays and everything else. That's a lot more opportunity to sell more product. And I, I, there's some manufacturers say, Oh no, we do it in house and we're not interested. And I'm like, why are you not even interested in talking? And it's, you know, to me, conversations are free. And I think the more we yeah. have conversation, I think it, 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 it's smart and food should create conversation. And there is a manufacturer yeah. out there who really has pushed that over the years that she believes her product creates conversation. And I will never forget it when I first heard that as part of their tagline with their products. And They are exactly right. And I still work with them. They're one of our clients. I think they're one of the best in the industry. And I think people watch them and see what they do. And they're a leader. And um, I haven't used any names. Have you noticed that today? It's, I haven't called these people out because to me, I I think I, I just like the mystery of it. But some people who know me know exactly who I'm talking about. Totally, totally. Um, well, I think what you're doing is is definitely very impressive. What, with the clients, I would imagine it sounds like most of the, the clients you work with would be manufacturers. What are some of the areas that you feel as a whole they fall short on and where you can help them? 
can, can you say that question again? I, I lost a little bit of what you were asking. Yeah, I said with the, it sounds like your, your, the majority of your clients would be, you know, some sort of manufacturer as a, as a whole, or maybe just in general, what are some of the areas that you feel that they fall short in and, the, and what are, what is, what is it that you do to help them fill that gap? I think it's really focusing on the segments of the business. Okay. And I think it's also the manufacturers communicating with the distributors. And, you know, there's a lot of great manufacturers and every broker out there represent them and every distributor out there stocks them that they're smaller and they don't think they can do what the big boys are doing. And, you know, when we talk about the big boys, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, the Tysons of the world and the Campbells and the ConAgra's and the Nestle's of the world. These small manufacturers can do the same thing. They just have to have somebody that's going to, you know, and I always tell everybody, let's crawl, let's walk, let's run. You know, we don't have to go out of the gate and do all of it all at once. It's let's, let's figure out how to do it right. And let's figure out how to do it. What makes sense. And they'll say, oh, we don't have the funds. And I'm like, you wouldn't believe you really do. You know, let's, let's look at, I love looking at a budget saying, okay, where can we cut money to save money? And where can we spend money to make money? And you have to spend money to make money. And I, and I realize, you know, it's been a rough couple of years for some, and, you know, hopefully we're getting out of these supply chain issues. And I, I think we are, but I think, um, I think the manufacturers and the distributors need to talk more and there needs to be the conversation, not about how much are you going to pay us, but what can we do to work together to sell more product? Cause it's already in the building. And, you know, I, I've said to several distributors out there, let's talk about those local manufacturers that you really like, that you really want to support, because there's local manufacturers in every market that will never be a national manufacturer. And let's figure out how do we help them and how do we partner them together to move product. And I, I love, you know, I, I love sitting down in a broker's office and just chatting. And talking to the team saying, you know, okay, what, what, what keeps you up every day and what drives you crazy? And let's figure out a solution. I, you know, for years, my mother said to me, what do you do? And she never understood. And I finally said, mom, I'm a solution provider. I provide solutions <laughs> to people that have problems. Oh, no, I totally get it. And you yeah. and I had this conversation when we had lunch <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Nobody yes. understands what a food broker does. They just don't get it. They, they think no you are idea. the distributor. They have no clue. So I tell her I provide I, solutions. And to me, that's, I think it's fun also after 40 years and being in every part. I mean, I did international business overseas. You know, we did the military food shows overseas in Europe and in, uh, in England. And, you know, we've traveled and done that. And I've done all the GPOs of the world. And I've been in every segment there is in the industry. And I still love it. And I can't believe this. You know, I thought I was going to be retiring, you know, yeah, a couple a lot of years fun. ago. And I still love what I'm doing. And, you know, that's why I'm sitting here. I'm still enjoying it. And I think there's still, and I love to see people grow in the business and, you know, still a lot of fun. What advice would you give to a manufacturer that maybe they have a retail presence and, or maybe they're international and they're trying to break into the food service market here in America? It depends on the size of that manufacturer. I think some okay. of the manufacturers that are in, that are really trying to break in, it may make sense sometimes for them to partner with somebody who already does it right. And if you're trying to break in, especially with a frozen item these days, how hard is it to get a freezer slot? We all know how hard it is. But if you're really good at manufacturing, you're only going to have a couple of items. Why not talk to the experts in the industry and say, okay, who can we become part of? I mean, we've had co-packing for how many years? It's almost the same thing, but mm -hmm. instead of co-packing, you're just going to become part of their lineup of products. And, you know, now you don't have to hire a whole sales force. They're already working the line because as we all know, it costs a lot of money for you to put a sales rep on the street to go out and sell product. And, you've got the big boy manufacturers that are paying a lot of money that are expecting you out there. 
And it's hard for these manufacturers to break in and go, hey, we want you to take on our line. There's only two items and we have no distribution. Well, that's not going to work. But if you've already got a decent sized manufacturer, a mid sized manufacturer, we've added another category to the line. You're going to get paid the same commissions. You know, availability is good because now the products in our forwarding warehouse or, you know, we've got it in our warehouse. So it's going to ship with our product. So we've made it easy for the distributor. We've made it easy for the operator to get it. I would feel they should, they, they are better off in today's world rather than trying to break in on their own, partnering with another manufacturer. You never know that manufacturer down the road may say, hey, it's time to buy you. And, you know, that's how successful smaller companies produce product and eventually they're sold to a larger company. That's, yeah, I, I'd like to see I, I've got a manufacturer client. Yeah, I've got a manufacturer client right now who that, that's kind of how they broke into food service is partnered up with a, an existing manufacturer in food service who has a sizable uh, distribution network. And, you know, really, they, they partnered together and, and the business grew well. And, and now they've, they've since gone off and done their own things. But uh, you know, it seemed to be a very successful venture for them. And I think it probably maybe eliminated a lot of headaches that would have been there pioneering it by yourself, as opposed to, to partnering up with an existing food service player. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's a smart way to go. It really is. Totally. I've got a fun question for you. If, <laughs> if you had... If you had the attention of the whole food service industry for just five minutes, what are some of the things you'd say? Wow. If I had the attention of the whole food service industry for five minutes, mm -hmm. don't be complacent. Okay. Look outside the box. You may have done it the same way all these years but there could be another way to do it. And you just have to open up the lid and look and see if there's another opportunity or another way. Hmm. And don't be afraid to ask a question. I think so many people out there, you know, they get set in their ways. Um, I think they really need to, you have to rebrand yourself. You have to give yourself a fresh look every couple of years. And I know people love their brands and they feel they've got the best, but constructive criticism and, you know, allowing others to offer advice, I think really helps. And you're going to love this one. Try eating your own product and see what you really think. And yeah, good point. Try taking the recipes that your chef creates and making them yourself and see what really happens. And every once in a while, go stand in a kitchen for an hour on a Saturday night at eight o'clock in the middle of the summer where it's over 90 degrees outside, just so you can understand what people are going through. Because yeah. I think sometimes they don't. One thing that I used to love was we as a broker, this is many years ago, we got to ride on a Cisco truck to see what it was like for one day. And let me tell you something. People don't realize what the drivers go through. First of all, fighting traffic, finding a place to park the truck, getting yelled at by people because they parked the truck somewhere. It's pouring rain, it's freezing, and you're trying to wheel in boxes into a back door that hasn't been cleaned and sanitized for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> people don't realize, but I, I was told many years ago by somebody I worked with, take off the blinders. Mm-hmm. You know, one of, the, one of the greatest things working for Hilton was when we parked every morning, we were not allowed to park in the same place. We had to come, we had 18 doors in the hotel, 18 entrances. 
we had to come in a different door every day, but we couldn't go out the same door we came in. We were supposed to go out another door as management of the hotel. And that was so that you would see something because we were required to write so many maintenance requests per day. Mm -hmm. You know, if people are coming in to a hotel and they're paying, this is back in the eighties and they're paying at that time, $150 a night, it was a lot of money. Yeah. And they don't want to see wallpaper torn, light bulbs out, crooked tablecloths on restaurant tables, a salt and pepper shaker half empty when they were the first ones to sit down when you open. And I say this to every restaurateur, if there's anything you can do, make sure you got the right menu. Make sure it looks good because we do a menu program for a lot of people. And that was one of the questions when I was at a, at a show a couple of weeks ago. I was down in Biloxi, Mississippi at a show. Very well attended food show. They, they knew how to do that food show. So well attended. Operators were just awesome to talk to. And I said to the operators, I said, remember, I, I say two things to you. Make sure all the light bulbs are working when you open your restaurant. The worst thing you can do is have light bulbs out in the restaurant because it's the easiest thing to change. And second of all, make sure the menu represents who you are. Because when people sit down and they see a menu that's poorly designed or poorly written, they're going to say to each other, is this chicken parm for $27.95 going to be worth $27.95? Look at this menu. And... You know, it used to be in the good old days when every restaurant put a bread basket on the table, but that doesn't happen anymore. If the bread was awful, this is an indication or, you know, you'd walk into a sandwich shop. And when we first started selling frozen bread, everybody's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I'd say to people, you could have the best, most expensive sliced turkey breast or sliced roast beef and have really bad bread in your sandwich. Well, Plain English, it sucks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I would, I would just tell the restaurant, you know, the people in the food service industry, it's, it's, it's only food and nobody dies. Mm -hmm. And work together because the end result is really allowing a chef, a cook, a busboy, a waiter, a dishwasher to go stand in the restaurant and see a lot of people smiling. Yeah. And if you walk into a restaurant and you see a lot of people sitting at tables smiling, you've done something right. You really have. Yeah, it's very true. Well, Joel, I want to say thank you for our conversation. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, from our lunch that we had just about a month ago, I, I've learned so much from you. So I just thank you for taking time out of your day. And I really appreciate your wisdom and your openness. And uh, I also enjoy the mystique as well. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was also refreshing. So thank you for, for joining me here. Uh, You're welcome. On the podcast. Always a pleasure. Thank you.